Welcome to NTD Business. I'm Don Ma. And of course, today is Inflation Day. CPI numbers out today. The rate of inflation has slowed for the 11th consecutive month. It cooled to its lowest annual rate in about two years last month. This is according to the Labor Department. The Consumer Price Index, CPI, barely rose in May. And year over year, it fell 0.9%. It's sitting at 4% in the month ending May. Overall inflation is decelerating thanks to energy and food costs. Food commodity prices have dropped back to levels seen prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The price of eggs fell nearly 14% compared to last month. Now, this is the largest decrease in over 70 years. Inflation is decelerating also thanks to the decreases in costs of energy products and services. For example, gasoline and electricity. However, inflation is proving a bit sticky on the core side. In the 12 months through May, the core CPI climbed 5.3%. High rents continue to put upward pressure on the core CPI. Used cars and trucks also giving it a boost. But beyond May, core inflation is expected to slow driven by a moderation in rents. Rent measures in the CPI tend to lag by several months. And here to talk to me is Mark Hamrick, Senior Economic Analyst, Bankrate.com. So let's talk about the headline CPI and then the the core CPI. Headline number, we got 4.0%, down 9 tenths uh, year over year. Uh, Seems like we're making uh, some progress here with the inflation fight. Well, we've seen, I would say, progress in the war on inflation, but uh, the battle isn't won, of course, when we see just the headline inflation up 4% over the past year and higher than that on the uh, benchmark, which excludes food and energy, which typically we'd be excluding those because they're more volatile. But the reality is that all these prices have been volatile as we've been dealing with what had been the highest inflation in four decades, of course. You know, we, we are still well down from the peak. Remember, on the headline Uh, from last uh, June we were at 9.1 percent on an annual increase on headline consumer price index so that was quite stunning when we were knocking on the door of a double digit increase as we look around the world Europe has had it worse than we have had so that is sort of uh, cold comfort as the saying goes because uh, just because someone else is perhaps suffering more doesn't mean that uh, the suffering that we've had in this country with where really high and persistent inflation uh, has taken a toll on households and businesses. And that's what got the Federal Reserve in the game of raising interest rates in March of last year, when many of us uh, had been lulled into a sense of complacency that record low interest rates would be a thing that might last forever. But uh, inflation and the performance of the economy had some other ideas. Now, this weaker print on the headline number, um, do you think it's simply a function of how high it was last year? I mean, this year over year comparison, is is this simply just a function of math? Well, obviously, uh, we're talking about statistics that are generated uh, through that process, but these are indicative of what's happening in the real economy. And there have been numerous disinflationary forces at work. And we think about in the U.S. economy, as the Federal Reserve began raising interest rates, the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy felt those impacts first. And we saw that, for example, in the stock market, uh, where we saw the high-flying technology sector really come down to earth. Uh, We saw the housing market cool, although, again, here in the spring in the U.S., we're seeing some signs that uh, the housing market is uh, very active with a low amount of supply of homes available. And so even though we have a benchmark 30-year fixed um, rate mortgage at nearly 7%, Sometimes just people have to move. They just can't cancel their lives. And so to your uh, earlier point of the question, I think that the Fed's medicine is working. It's not finished. And that's sort of one of the big questions is, what is the outlook for monetary policy in the future and whether we can back down from these higher interest rates at some point as well? So, Mark, on the core side, uh, we got a little bit more sticky inflation, 5.3% year over year. What do you think it's contributing to this stickiness? 
Well, let's note, first of all, with the annual rise in the CPI of, I think, 5.3 percent, that's down from the peak of 6.6, but that's still way too high for the Federal Reserve to be comfortable when we think about its 2 percent target. And the Fed may have uh, an opinion about the idea of whether that 2 percent target is attainable at some point down the road. We'll get an update on that as they release uh, their uh, collective summary of economic projections. But to your point, Don, first of all, we think about the impact of high uh, transportation costs and how long it can really take to sort of extract that out of the system from the standpoint of, you know, you, you've had fuel prices come down, but, you know, they stu still have had an impact, meaning, let's say, needing to get things to market when we think about food and, and goods. Uh, and uh, still strong, sufficiently strong demand for goods, but more demand for services. So services inflation has been more persistent. And to your point, uh, the measures of essentially uh, the cost of uh, living at a place, uh, whether in a home that is owned or a home that is rented by uh, the residents, uh, that is seen as a stickier metric. It's not necessarily reflective of what's going on in the economy, but you know, measurement is something that is part of this process. And so as you try to capture that data, you have to essentially you know, go with what you've got. And there are some other real-time metrics, for example, of rent you know, taken nationwide that indicate that there has been more substantial cooling, but it doesn't necessarily show up in this data. And of course, the Federal Reserve knows that as well. So how does the numbers we got today, uh, how does that factor into the decision tomorrow with the Fed? Well, coming into a Federal Reserve meeting, first of all, unless there's something truly momentous or dynamic going on, the decision is, you know, coalesced around what the chairman hopes to produce in the form of a consensus really coming into this two-day meeting. And so uh, we have had it uh, where on a Friday before the Wednesday meeting, there was a surprise last June where uh, officials signaled that they were going to raise by 75 basis points rather than the 50 basis points that had sort of been baked into the market. But in this situation, there isn't enough of a change in direction in the CPI relative to expectations that we would see any reason for them to change what the markets have priced in, and that is that the Fed uh, pauses at this June meeting, but keeps the idea of a rate hike at the end of July at the following meeting very much on the agenda. Uh, and uh, we'll see how they look to set the table for that uh, end of July meeting as well. And can you also speak to the, the dilemma that the Fed is facing or the challenges that the Fed is facing currently? I think last week the S&P went into a bull market. Um, up 20% from, from its lows. Uh, that's one definition of a bull market. And as well, the, the amount of liquidity still within the system, within the, within the U.S. economy, it's, um, it's keeping the consumers, you know, they're spending up, right? It's, it's remaining uh, resilient to a degree. So the Fed would really need to lower um, unemployment, let's say, or slow, slow things down. I mean, just speak to that a little bit. Those are good observations, Don. Uh, first of all, you're right. Uh, the benchmark 500, S&P 500 index did rise to a 20 percent gain above uh, last October's lows. And we've had sort of a concentration of the biggest technology names leading that parade and, and leading uh, the even better performance in the NASDAQ composite index. Uh, and what if there's a complaint about the performance of the stock market, it is that uh, you have what we often call the generals leading uh, the rise, but the rest of the would-be uh, army, uh, the soldiers aren't necessarily following. It's a complaint about the quality, the breadth of the stock market rally. So we'll see if that fully resolves itself and whether this uh, market move remains intact. But to your point, you know, the Fed does see that as, you know, sort of head scratching and wondering, hmm, you know, have we not been sort of um, uh, hawkish enough in, in our uh, in our language to, to try to keep that liquidity more at a more stable late uh, state. And of course, we're coming off, uh, even though we're almost into July here, we're still coming off of what was a mini banking crisis in March when we had uh, those banking failures. And uh, uh, it's the observation of, of Federal Reserve officials and others that it appears the banking system remains uh, stable and sound. Uh, but, uh, you know, I suppose you might 
might say that as they look back on the past several months, they'd welcome the fact that the financial system appears to be functioning well. I mean, clearly that's part of their um, sort of unspoken mandate, and that's financial stability. Uh, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Don. You know, that goes into the mix of, you know, do they need to sort of tamp that down? Because they certainly don't want to have a, a situation with the, with the U.S. economy where uh, there's too much heat. But I think there's sufficient challenges going on with the economy right now, whether it's a contraction of manufacturing, a weakness in the global economy. Remember, we've had two straight quarters of contraction in the Eurozone, and China has its challenges. So even if the U.S. Uh, were to look uh, abroad, I think it would say, you know, we may be importing some weakness into the United States from the global economy, and, and that may cool some things, uh, including some of the things that you just referenced. Right. And there's a lot of signs of weakness within the economy. You mentioned manufacturing. I think that's in construction territory for a few months now. But services mm -hmm. has been holding up. Um, employment has been holding up. But let me have you comment on this point as well. The Fed is trying to slow down inflation. Meanwhile, the federal government is uh, still spending, um, uh, whether that's injecting liquidity into the economy, um, um, spending on the economy, infrastructure, what, what whatever it is, um, and, and that's holding up the economy because when, when you put liquidity into the economy, it's, it's harder for it to slow down. Can you comment on that? It's correct that you know, there are a number of tailwinds behind the economy that include the previous uh, acts of legislation, uh, the infrastructure spending that uh, was agreed to uh, previously, the debt ceiling uh, sort of package that was meant to resolve that uh, near crisis is uh, certainly not inflationary, but uh, but it does uh, kind of constrain a federal spending uh, somewhat and may have an impact on GDP of maybe one to two tenths of one percent, something along those lines. So that's that is sort of on the downside, uh, but not significant ultimately. So um, the economy really here is is essentially going to have to walk on its own with all these other things going on, and the fact that uh, before we know it, we're really sort of getting deeper into the general election season, including the presidential nominating process and the general election in the U.S. And while there have been perhaps a surprising number of bipartisan bills passed by the Congress and signed by the president in recent years, I think we're probably going to see a more treacherous, more treacherous political sledding in the near term. And that's been signaled by the uh, angry conservatives in the Congress who weren't happy that that legislation went through with the uh, with the negotiation attended by the Speaker of the House. So I wouldn't look for anything uh, dynamic really coming out of this Congress but before the next election, uh, minus any sort of crisis situation. And so uh, I think monetary policy and, and geopolitical events are going to be the biggest things to watch. Hope, hopefully there aren't any geopolitical crises. Uh, we had enough of that with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the inflationary impacts there. But uh, the, I think, if anything, the remarkable thing about the U.S. economy has been that it's been more resilient. And that includes the resilience of the job market, where up until recently we were still matching a historic low in the unemployment rate of 3.4 percent. Jobs creation has continued at a fairly robust pace. But, uh, you know, past performance doesn't guarantee uh, the future. And so we'll uh, be something to continue to discuss. Well, all right. Thank you so much this morning, Mark. Uh, always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, Don. Thank you for having me. And another thing I want to talk about is Reddit. Users are boycotting the platform. Reddit users launched a 48-hour blackout. Now, here's everything you need to know about this. Thousands of popular Reddit communities dedicated to topics ranging from Apple to gaming and music locked out their users on Monday. This is in protest against the company's plan to charge for access to its platform's data. So starting next month, third-party app developers using Reddit's vast troves of data will have to pay a price. And the changes could affect players across the spectrum from deep-pocketed companies like OpenAI to small developers. The Apollo app, popular among Redditors for its alternate interface to the official platform, has said the exorbitant fees have made it impossible to continue offering the service. So here are some facts about the protest. First, what prompted the blackout? 
The action has been in the works for weeks after Reddit announced in April that it would start charging third parties for its application programming interface, or API. This is a software framework that allows a data provider and end user to communicate with each other. From July 1st, Reddit plans to charge developers that require higher usage limits 24 cents for every 1,000 API calls or less than $1 per user every month. Apollo said that with their current usage, the charges would cost more than $20 million a year. So why is Reddit making the change? One of the reasons is generative AI. Reddit's conversation forums have a lot of data that can be used to train tools like ChatGPT, for example. While some of this data can be collected in an unstructured fashion, Reddit's API makes it easier for companies to directly find and collate the data. Reddit CEO Steve Huffman said in an interview with the New York Times in April that the Reddit corpus of data is really valuable. And he doesn't want to give all of that value to some of the largest companies in the world for free. So then who gets affected and when will the Reddit blackout end? Thousands of subreddits, uh, the forums dedicated to a specific topic on Reddit, are protesting the move, and most of their moderators have planned a 48-hour blackout during which the pages will go private, and that means millions of users will be left without access. Subreddits like music, gaming, science, uh, Today I Learned, all with more than 30 million subscribers, mind you, are participating. Some subreddits, like music for example, plan to protest indefinitely. Now, unlike most other social media platforms, Reddit is heavily dependent on community moderators who police their subreddits for free to weed out offensive or illegal content. So what are third-party app developers saying? The creator of the Apollo app for Reddit last week tweeted the service will close down on June 30th. So what has been Reddit's response? Its CEO Steve Huffman on Friday noted the frustration among many moderators of Reddit communities, but also said that the company can no longer subsidize commercial entities that require large-scale data use because it needs to be a self-sustaining business.